Hey, you want to be in a podcast? A podcast? Of course I like to be in a podcast. How you doing? I'm Dan. Okay, Dan, I'm Khalil. Khalil? Yes. We have a podcast about energy, and this is about the grid, which is the how power gets from one place to another. Can I ask you a few questions about that? Yes. All right, cool. Hey, everybody, this is Dan Wood, and I'm out here on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. We're here to talk to people about something that's all around them, but they don't think about it very much. We're talking about the electrical grid. Let's see how much people really know about where we get our electricity. Electricity that lights our homes, charges our phones, and brings us this podcast. My name's John. My name is Omar. Martha. Sander. My name's Shafna. My name is Laura. Where do you think the power starts? From a lot of things, right? Maybe, I don't know, one of them is friction. Have you ever heard of the term the power grid? I think I've heard of it, but I don't know what it is. If you had to like imagine what a power grid would be, what would you? I imagine a bunch of... Um, what is it called? Solar panels, but that's that's not it. Do you know where your power comes from? Are you talking about electric power? Like yes. my electricity from my home? Correct. No, I don't. Okay. Sorry. Um, I do not. I have a like I have an image of it in okay. my head, but I don't Tell know. us about that. I, well, I can use the word grid, it's like one big grid and I just see a bunch of like electrical uh, uh <laughs> Like stuff. <laughs> well, it comes from Homer City, the okay. power plant, which is mostly coal. So, where does power start? Well, I believe power starts at the power sources, which are the power plants. Okay. Uh, the energy is generated through cables and wires, which eventually makes its way and travels to our homes. Okay, very good. Have you ever heard of a uh, transformer? From the movie? No, from <laughs> science. <laughs> um, no. Okay. How old would you guess the oldest part of the grid is? Wow, I know I have actually looked at electric generation stations that are back into the early 1900s. It's pretty old. 60 years. 1920. How, How old? old is the oldest part of the power grid? Who? A couple of hundred years? The very first one was in Lower Manhattan in 1882. Thomas Edison opened the very first uh, electrical grid. Mm, so I knew it should have went back a little bit more. What do you think is the number one cause of power outages in the United States? A, a squirrel, just one squirrel, like this one squirrel named Jerry. B, transformer failure. C, severe weather. Or D, overloaded grid. I would say overloaded grid. Technology failure, performance failure, you know, old infrastructure. Wow, I would say probably weather, but I could well be wrong. Ding, yeah. ding, ding. That That's is correct. Yeah. So clearly some people have a pretty good understanding of how the electrical grid works. But there's a lot of us that don't. And that's what this episode of Direct Current is all about. Understanding the grid. We've got a lot to learn, so stick around. All the District Department of Energy does. The purpose of this is to show you how to use your imagination. A foundation in science, technology, engineering, and math. Developing these technologies. More science. Climate change. We're talking about energy. Big dreams. Clean energy is way of the future. This is Direct Current. Hello and welcome to another episode of Direct Current. I'm Matt Dozier. And I'm Allison Lantero. Today we're talking about an invention that the National Academy of Engineering called one of the greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century, and yet we constantly take it for granted. The electric grid. Yeah, I definitely didn't know how the electric grid really worked until I started here at the Department of Energy. Me either. We tend to not think about the grid until something goes wrong, like it did in the city of Hoboken, New Jersey in October 2012. Clear and present danger, Sandy swirls along the East Coast. 433,000 homes and businesses are still without power. But the National Guard arrived late last night to help evacuate residents in Hoboken, New Jersey. Most of us only heard the news stories about Superstorm Sandy, but Allison Outwater, a student at Stevens Institute of Technology, lived it. My house, we lost power. We lost part of our roof, but I mean, that was nothing. The city was a mess. Most of the city was underwater. Only a couple of blocks didn't lose power, but everyone else in the city didn't have power. Hoboken is home to over 50,000 people. The city sits across from New York City, right on the Hudson River. Right after Sandy hit, of course, we also got hit by a snowstorm, so it was extremely cold out. That snowstorm 
was very difficult for the people who didn't have power because then it was also extremely cold. So all across the city, there was down trees everywhere. Water was extremely dangerous. It was a couple feet high in many areas, and a lot of residents were trapped where they were. Allison, who comes from a family of first responders, decided to go to City Hall and volunteer to help those who'd been flooded out and lost power. In the pitch black, she went on a rescue mission to rescue an elderly woman without power. And her phone even became an emergency hotline for the city. I still get phone calls from people on my cell phone. The older people who don't realize that, like, I'm not Hoboken, they still call me. Within her first day of volunteering, Allison became the volunteer coordinator for the entire city of Hoboken. People even mistook her for the mayor. Meanwhile, the real mayor of Hoboken, Don Zimmer, was assessing the damage, distributing donations, and comforting the city's residents. You know, I went around and tried to hand out food during Sandy, and there was a senior that literally cried on my shoulder and just said, like, I, I can't even, I can't leave here. Like, the, there's not even any lights on in the hallway. There's not an exit sign. I can't get out. It was difficult to even have the power for our police station. We couldn't get fuel into the city to power the generator. The water came in, the Hudson River came in on us and literally filled up uh, the western side of the city like a bathtub. It flooded nearly 80% of the city, including Hoboken's electric substations, which distribute electricity throughout the city. Most residents were without power for two entire weeks. Think about that for a second. Two weeks without microwaves and refrigerators, without the internet, without lights after the sun goes down. I was lucky and at my dorm I had electricity, but I wasn't there. I was in City Hall, which did not have power. We had one generator to operate all of the systems that we needed, and it was really difficult. There was a lot of time. I never realized how much I appreciate my computer and a printer. I never realized how much being able to turn a light on is just great. The few people that did have power, were running power strips out of their homes so people who didn't have power or who couldn't get in their apartments could plug in their phones and contact their loved ones. And while citizens were sharing cell phone charges, Mayor Zimmer was thinking about how to improve the entire city's electric resiliency in the face of future storms. What we found is we need a grocery store to have power so that that becomes like the place where people can get food. We need for the pharmacy to have power because getting medication um, to our seniors was extremely important. I mean, seniors were, were frantic about not having their medication. So there's certain things that we realized through the storm that are really, you know, potentially important, and that all kind of coalesced around the idea of, of the microgrid. That's right. A microgrid. Uh, hold on a second. Can I interrupt here? Yeah, what's up? Well, before we talk about microgrids, I was thinking we should talk about how the grid works, like the big one. Good point. Where should we start? Let's talk to somebody who really knows this stuff. Can we start at the beginning here? Can you tell me where our electricity comes from? So for most people, it starts with power plants, which convert energy sources like coal and nuclear and renewable energy like solar and wind into electricity. Electricity, you can think about it, it's the means by which we move that energy from the supplier or the power plants uh, to your homes and businesses. Tell us what your title is. I am Liz Dalton, and I am the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Department of Energy's Office of Electricity, Delivery, and Energy Reliability. Say that 10 times fast. It's a pretty long title. Ridiculously long title. So what you do here is you work with the grid, basically, right? Uh, pretty much, yeah. So obviously there isn't a long extension cord running from a power plant to my house. Uh, where does it go from there? Traditionally, it's easiest to think about electricity as a three-step process. Generation, transmission, and distribution. So after electricity is generated, as we just discussed, it travels to customers through the electric grid. The electric grid is an interconnected network of power lines and other equipment for delivering electricity from the power plants to the consumers. So if you're talking about transmission, it's how we move the electricity through power lines at high voltage across long distances. Then you have distribution, which is when electricity travels through different wires at lower voltages to places like your homes and businesses. So think of it this way. 
A highway, when you're cruising along in your car at 80 miles per hour, that's transmission. To get from that highway to your house, you need to take an off-ramp and slow down to 35 miles per hour. Then you're driving on surface streets until you reach your destination. That's distribution. So all these power plants and power lines and, and other stuff, they make up the electrical grid, right? Yeah, pretty much. It's one big system in North America. Of course, Hawaii and Alaska have islanded grids, but the North American grid is broken down into three big pieces. We call these interconnections. We have the Eastern Interconnect, the Western Interconnect, and then there's Texas. So Texas has its own power grid, basically? Pretty much. Has it, has it always been that way, or has this changed over time? Uh, it's actually changed dramatically over time. So back in the late 1800s, when the first power plant opened in New York City, it only served uh, 82 customers. Now we have a system in the United States with over 140 million customers. Let me just take a step back and talk about what an amazing invention the electric grid is. 130 years ago, this thing didn't exist. Now almost everything we do relies on it. You charge your phone. You dry your hair. You watch TV. In some cases, you drive electric vehicles, your financial transactions. Literally, almost everything you do is possible because we figured out how to make this grid work. It's grown exponentially, it's gotten more complicated, and today we're seeing a massive change in the way that electricity is delivered and managed. You might drive through neighborhoods and see solar panels on roofs. Uh, literally, customers are now able to produce their own electricity right at home. And the grid has to be updated to keep up with those changes. One of the things the Department of Energy is doing is trying to make the grid work better, right? How are you helping with this transformation over time? So I probably should have added in there that the nation's energy infrastructure is 90% owned by industry. So the role of the Department of Energy in this is to work with industry and modernize this grid by developing innovative technologies and providing technical assistance to states who are examining policies in light of these changes. We have literally invested billions of dollars over the last decade to help uh, smooth this transition to ensure that our system is safer, reliable, secure, and, and now, thankfully, increasingly more clean. Well, thanks so much, Liz. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Glad to be here. So now that we understand how the commercial grid works, I think we're ready to talk microgrids with an expert. That expert is Abraham Ellis, the manager of the Photovoltaics and Distributed System Integration Group at Sandia National Lab. A microgrid is just a small version of, of a grid, but it is, in the case of a microgrid, designed to provide a local solution. So you can actually design a microgrid to um, meet the needs of something like a 100-year flood, for example. Basically, if another big storm hit Hoboken, the kind that comes once every 100 years, here's how the microgrid would work. When the grid goes down, natural gas generators would kick on and distribute power to important buildings, like shelters, hospitals, and city hall, until full power was restored. Once the idea for a microgrid arose, Mayor Zimmer and her staff started pitching it to various organizations who visited in the wake of the storm, and the Energy Department's Sandia National Lab agreed to help study the feasibility of a microgrid. On the technical side, the biggest challenge there is that the design basis for the project involves looking at a situation where the majority of the city of Hoboken would actually be underwater, which is what happened during Hurricane Sandy. There were very few parts of the city that were <clears throat> actually dry. And on top of figuring out how to keep cables dry, the team also had to look at how to connect services that were spread throughout different parts of the city, sometimes miles apart. For example, shelters, hospitals, and fire stations and so on that were in parts of the city that require us to cross quite a distance that might be underwater. The Hoboken microgrid, still in its design phase, would be the first of its kind in the country. And Mayor Zimmer is keeping a watchful eye over the process. My number one job is to keep the residents of Hoboken safe. So you, you, know, you take it one step at a time and you, you get to the top of the mountain. And that's what we're trying to do here in Hoboken. And it isn't just the mayor who's thinking about preparing for energy emergencies. Every two years, the Department of Energy hosts the Solar Decathlon, a competition that challenges teams of college students to design, build, and operate solar-powered houses that are cost-effective, energy-efficient, and attractive. Remember Allison Atwater, the student from the beginning of the show? She was part of the Stevens Institute of Technology team that competed in last year's Solar Decathlon against 13 teams from around the world. 
They called their storm-resistant design the Sure House. First place overall. Winner of the Saudi Capital 2015 goes to Stevens Institute of Technology. On behalf of the Holden Sure House team, uh, we come from a community that has a lot of frustrated people dealing with rebuilding, uh, and we're really be we're really happy to be here with some forward-thinking ideas and really bring um, the energy back to our communities that we were. Uh, grown up in. So uh, thanks to my team, thanks to our great faculty and staff and all the support we have back home. Uh, thanks guys. And as a member of the winning design team, Allison's experience during Sandy inspired parts of the storm proofing on the house, from storm shutters to waterproof materials. Shutters that we had on our home were really influenced by some of the experiences in Sandy. We had so many people who stayed that shouldn't have stayed. They knew they should have evacuated, but they were afraid to. They think that by staying, they can protect their home, and it's the opposite. With Sure House, if you want to be able to protect your home, you have to leave. You can only protect your home fully from the exterior. To be able to put the shutters down, you have to be on the exterior of the home. So that, of course, means that you need to leave the house. To be able to put the plugs in the windows and doors, you need to be on the exterior of the home. It really encourages people to not stay at home. Allison also served as the health and safety officer for the team. I've always kind of been that friend that always tells people not to do something stupid. My friends always joke with me about it, and especially like from the first responders aspect, I see a lot of people do stuff that could be preventive. She was kind of like the team mom. Yeah, that's very much what it was, yeah. But the team also provided assistance for community members who might not evacuate, inspired by people who are plugging in power strips to help their neighbors and recognizing that their solar powered home might be a bright spot during a neighborhood power outage, they outfitted the house with charging ports. It's a little box that's actually for the car charger and um, mechanical equipment. But on the front of it, we have these plugs that you see. Um, they're, they almost look like um, the chargers in your car, like the round things, the covers, and in those are actually USB ports, and they're completely watertight, so as long as they're closed, it, they can flood, and when the flood waters recede, those will be protected, and anyone from the community can come and use those ports to be able to charge their phones or their devices that they need, uh, even if no one's in the home. Neither the Sure House nor the microgrid is going to prevent another superstorm from happening. The goal here is resiliency and helping a community bounce back in the wake of a disaster. Allison says the Sure House is coming back to New Jersey, where it will serve as a reminder to be prepared for emergencies. In the same way, the goal of the microgrid is to prepare Hoboken for the next emergency that comes its way. But Allison Atwater needs no reminder. I now carry flashlights with me everywhere because you never know when the power is going to go out. Okay, we know we threw a lot at you in this episode. So head to energy.gov slash podcast, where we put together some infographics, blogs, and even a video to help explain the grid in even more detail. And if you have questions about this episode, feel free to send us an email at directcurrent at hq.doe.gov or tweet at energy. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, and if you get a chance, leave us a rating or review. We really appreciate the feedback. We'd like to thank Allison Outwater, Mayor Don Zimmer, Caleb Stratton, Abraham Ellis, Liz Dalton, and Allison Kennedy for helping us out with this episode. Direct Current is produced by Matt Dozier, Simon Edelman, and me, Allison Lantero, with segment producer Daniel Wood. Art and design by Carly Wilkins, with support from Pat Adams, Paul Lester, Atik H, and Ernie Ambrose. Special thanks to our intern, Cole Edick, and our boss, Marissa Newhall. Thanks to John LaRue, the Energy Public Affairs team, and the DOE Media team. We're a production of the Department of Energy and published from our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Until next time, thanks for listening.